immense pleasure in welcoming Professor Amartya Sen on behalf of the University of Hyderabad and also my personal behalf today. And to this audience, Professor Amartya Sen does not need an introduction, but it is my duty to uh, welcome Professor Amartya Sen and also mention that briefly his uh, professional uh, biography. One, Professor Amartya Sen is currently Thomas Lamont University Professor and Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard University. And until 2004, he held the position of Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. But Sen is also Chancellor and Chairman of the Book Governing Board of Nalanda University. He is a Senior Fellow at Harvard Society of Fellows. Earlier on, he was Professor of Economics at Jadavpur University, Calcutta, Delhi School of Economics and London School of Economics, and Dramont Professor of Political Economy at Oxford University. Professor Sen, your contributions encompass several disciplines in social science, disciplines in social sciences and philosophy. Professor Sen, you are our role model for most of us, for all of us here, and we are privileged to have you for here today and to honor you with our honoris causa. I request Professor Ramasamy to read the citation. <laughs> Professor said, in 1993, the University of Hyderabad conferred upon you the degree, the honorary degree of Doctor of Literature, honoris causa. At that time, uh, the School of Social Sciences uh, uh, nominated you for this award and the university was very pleased to, uh, to uh, grant you this award. On the 13th convocation of the university that was held on uh, the 1st of October 2011, uh, we conferred the honorary doctorate degree in literature on this causa on you in absentia. The university is very grateful to you for having come here today so that we can present this uh, degree in person 20 years after we had initially um, awarded it to you. <laughs> and, <laughs> Professor Sen, you are one of the most significant economists of our age and an outstanding voice for justice in the world today. You have greatly improved our understanding of the causes of hunger and famine in the world. Born in 1933 on the campus of Vishwabharati University at Shantiniketan, you completed the first degree in 1953 as a student at Presidency College, Calcutta. At Trinity College, Cambridge, you earned the PhD in economics and were appointed Professor of Economics at Jadavpur University at the age of 23. In 1963, In 1963, you moved to the Delhi School of Economics, where you stayed till 1971. During those years, you developed the seminal work on social choice theory, leading to the publication of a path-breaking book, Collective Choice in Social Welfare, which deals with the relationship between individual preferences and their aggregation into collective preferences. By opening up a new field within the theory of social choice, you demonstrated how the possibility of identifying consistent social preferences is affected by the assumptions we make about interpersonal comparison. You then moved to London, where you taught at the London School of Economics. In 1977, you were appointed Professor of Economics at Oxford University, and in 1980, Drummond Professor of Political Economy at Oxford. In these years, your work in the field of welfare economics, dealing with issues including the assessment of poverty, the evaluation of inequality, the measurement of national income, unemployment, questions of personal liberty and rights, and gender inequality culminated in the book, Resources, Values and Development. Your concern for the problems of inequality and your dissatisfaction with mainstream analysis to deal with it prompted your observation that almost single-minded concern of modern welfare economics does not make that engaging branch of study particularly suitable for investigating problems of inequality. From the mid-1970s, you pursued work on the causes and prevention of famine, which produced, among other things, the classic book, Poverty and Famines. 
From the mid-1980s, your work became increasingly directed to the nature of individual advantage, which you approach from the point of view of understanding personal ability, which depends on physical and mental characteristics, as well as on social opportunities. At the end of the 80s, you took up professorship at Harvard University and remained there till 98, when you became Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. In the same year, you were awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics. In 2004, you returned to Harvard and held the position of Vermont University Professor and Professor of Economics and Philosophy. Your book, Development as Freedom, brought social and economic ideas to a wider, non-specialist audience. Professor Sen, you are an intellectual giant whose works and concerns are on issues that range well beyond economics. Your book of literary essays, The Argument of the Indian, bears testimony to this. Your use of part of the Nobel Award to establish the Pratichi Trust, which works in the field of literacy, basic health care, and gender equity in our country and Bangladesh, is laudable. It is fortunate that a scholar of your vision and stature has entirely explored the possibilities of making this world a better place. And we at the University of Hyderabad applaud your efforts. Sir, the University of Hyderabad is honored to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Literature, Honoris Causa, with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto. I now request of Sir Amal to say to give his acceptance speech. Now, sir, I'm obviously very moved, very touched, immensely proud of being extremely privileged to have this connection uh, uh, in this wonderful form with uh, uh, the University of Hyderabad. And I think since I'm giving a lecture later, I, I, I think I'm trying to give an acceptance speech would be difficult. I know that Hyderabad University has spoiled me by giving me the degree you repeated. <laughs> now, I don't think it should be retaliated by repeated speeches. <laughs> so I would just thank uh, the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, and for every one of you present here. I'm especially thrilled uh, to see my old friend, for the CRR here. We have been friends for a very long time. Samarth Sen will deliver the first Hyderabad uh, lecture in the Hyderabad lecture series. And I request Professor Ramakrishna Ramaswamy uh, <coughs> to mention a few words about the lecture series, Hyderabad lecture series. Friends, um, I'm very pleased today that. Uh, Professor Amartya Sen has kindly consented to give the first Hyderabad lecture, um, an important and I hope an important series of lectures for the that that has been um, con conceptualized in the city of Hyderabad and something that we hope will contribute to the intellectual life of the city. Let me give a little background. Uh, several people in this in, at different institutions in the city of Hyderabad. Um, have mentioned the need for uh, some kind of intellectual life for the city and based on these conversations with a variety of people uh, we thought up of having the following kind of format a certain amount of money that could be set aside every year 
uh, for conducting these lectures and to have the person contribute to the intellectual life of the city by bringing issues and concerns of, uh, that are of uh, uh, contemporary interest. And these lectures were to be, are to be delivered not just at the University of Hyderabad, but at other locations in the city, particularly on the campuses of other universities and uh, other public institutions. Uh, about two years ago, I wrote to the then chairman of the Insurance Reg Regulatory and Development Agency, the IRDA, uh, and uh, made the proposal that the IRDA could, along with the uh, University of Hyderabad, sponsor such a uh, Hyderabad lectures. And I'm very pleased to uh, announce today that the chairman of IRDA is here with us. And uh, I'm not actually sure where, but uh, yeah, Mr. Vijayan is here with us. And uh, the IRDA has decided to endow the university with a corpus, which will now fund in perpetuity uh, the Hyderabad lecture series, where we'll be able to bring intellectuals from any part of the world to contribute to the life of the city of Hyderabad. <laughs> the university is particularly grateful to IRDA for having taken, uh, for having been so generous in this and enabled us uh, to have this lecture series. Of course, we have started now with a very high bar, um, Professor Amartya Sen. Uh, you know, is, as the first of the lecturers, uh, lecturers at this particular series, uh, I think that uh, we, we know that we have a treat in store for us because every year uh, we will have to at least try to match this. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me conclude now by just uh, by thanking, uh, uh, thanking IRDA uh, for enabling uh, not just the university but the entire uh, city, of, uh, the city to have this kind of series. And we look forward to more such interactions with other agencies from time to time. Thank you very much. I think the way I should proceed is first to say a few words on the subject. I think I'll divide this. We don't have very much time uh, for, the, for this evening uh, because we are here with every, the number of um, events that have already occurred, uh, and I would like to have some time for Q&A, and you would like to have to finish up by six. So, I'll be speaking, hopefully, for about half an hour, and divide it into three parts. i first say something basically about the subject, maybe coffee houses and education. Then a little bit, I take the liberty of saying um, something about my own experiences and how that connection may be important for me. And then finally try to say something about contemporary India and how the issues that I'm trying to discuss in this relate to the future of, of contemporary India. The, I mean obviously when we talk about coffee house being talking for education, um, we couldn't possibly mean education at every level, primary, secondary, etc. I mean, the topic that is mainly about higher education. It had a particular role in higher education. It can have also in school education, but that becomes a more uh, particular, um, uh, it depends very much on circumstances. Coffee House as a concept is the importance of having dialogue and discussion, because coffee house is a place where that actually happens. You get an opportunity of getting away from your class, and you talk with others, and you have an opportunity to talk about issues that concern you. Uh, that could include the kind of issue that's being brought up now, namely the the plight of the uh, the 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 neglected and, and maltreated part of the Indian population over thousands of years, which include Dalits, not only Dalits, also include scheduled tribes in a very big way. And their uh, deprivation is sometimes even larger than that of the Dalits, as our book on, 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 uh, An Uncertain Glory brings out. Now, I think the issue here is this, that 
if having chosen to live in a democracy as we have uh, in India, if only implicitly, um, be uh, by remaining like I have an Indian citizen, as I am, though I teach in America, I remain exclusively an Indian citizen, I accept the democratic prerogative that the way to bring about a change is through discussion, persuasion, and ultimately voting, as well as um, demanding action, which can include uh, agitation in the streets. I've been involved in uh, food, uh, right to food agitation. I've been involved in minority right agitation. Um, I have actually also been involved in Dalit-centered agitation. Uh, it's a bigger issue uh, in some parts of India than than at other parts. And I can see that this could become a very big issue if, if I live somewhere else rather than something against you know, Calcutta and so on. On the other hand, it is, it's an issue even in Calcutta. There's no question about that. Um, the, I think the one thing is this, that um, in order to bring about a change, um, one has to uh, present arguments rather than preventing other people from speaking. And if I may say that, because I say that with some sense of uh, hurt, because I see myself on the side of Dalit agitation. And all it does here is to try to, in this case, what happened was try to prevent me from speaking on some other subject. And as I mentioned, I would have been very, very happy to talk about the Dalit situation in India, on which we have done a fair amount of research over the years, and the situation is quite terrible. I, I don't know anything about the circumstances, about the particular event here. Now, I think the point about Coffee House was to argue that our attitudes are formed in our college days, quite often, about what are we going to focus on in our life, whether we are going to leave our, lead our life in pursuit of those things in which we might be able to earn a high income, lead a life not only of comfort but also of luxury, and India offers enormous opportunities of that. If there are convictions to be formed about the need for social commitment, that's most likely to come in terms of, in, first of all, in the days when one is a young student studying in college, uh, it also begins in school, but ultimately it, it functions best in, 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 in most in the college situation. And also, at that time, it's not so much you will get that in the class, but the coffee house. And by coffee house, I mean a place where you can sit down with others and talk and try to persuade the opposition, persuade them of your position, and expect that it will have some kind of an effect on their lives. And certainly in my own life, I was going to, when I was interrupted in terms of from the shouting that took place, I was saying I was hoping to speak about three parts. One is about the nature of coffee house and engagement, and I think that given the time and given the spirit at this moment, I think it's probably dispensable. Uh, second was something to talk about my own life and how my own attitude, including my in connection to involved in agitation, not quite of this kind, but agitation of a of similar kind. They have you know argued for people's right to food, people die of hunger, people suffer from major undernourishment in India, the quality I mean I have had an opportunity of being a school teacher, even when I was myself finishing my own school in Santa Niketo we used to run a night school. And one of the remarkable things that comes through is how the ability of the children that we were trying to teach as an additional effort in our own school days, I mean, I was in, in very high level and I was about to move to presidency college, um, but it was quite remarkable for me to see that how the inability to pay attention is related to the hunger of the people who came to school. And that was later when I was lucky to get some money from the Nobel Foundation. I used 
I had this opportunity to use that money to start two trusts, one in India and one in Bangladesh, dealing with elementary schooling, elementary health care, and inequality, including between uh, upper and lower classes, upper and lower caste, uh, special attention to Dalit, as well as between men and women, and especially the neglect of young girls. Now, in that context, the Fertility Trust India had done a lot of research in a survey kind, and it's quite clear that large number of people's ability to uh, our, our attention was concentrated mostly on East India, um, uh, Bengal, uh, West Bengal, um, um, uh, Jharkhand, uh, um, um, Bihar, uh, and, 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 and in a small way, some of the other states in the East as well. But it was quite striking that the deprivation of food is a factor that not only ruins people's health, it also ruins people's education. Um, my friend James Heckman, who is a professor at Chicago, uh, who also got the Nobel Prize actually about, I think, six, seven years after me, um, he had done serious study about how undernourishment of the children and lack of care of the children at very early age reduces the development of cognitive ability, brain development, and their ability to lead a decent life and imbibe the opportunities of education that are offered and then lead the life of a full citizen. So in order to deal with the problems of inequalities in, in India, we need understanding of the source of these problems. And the sources are diverse. There's, of course, all prejudice, and caste prejudice is a very big one. The prejudice against tribal people is a very strong one, too. And in some areas, it could be in, certainly in the belt surrounding a part of West Bengal, Jharkhand, uh, Chhattisgarh, part of Bihar. These have been very big factors. In addition to prejudice, there are the purely economic issues about inability to earn an income, to have food, to be able to um, be disease-free in terms of undernourishment diseases are concerned. But on top of that, the lack of health care, which is abysmal in India, uh, also makes people much more prone to illnesses of various kinds. I think the reason why um, I think the Dalit agitation, if, if it is carried out in a uh, well-thought-out manner, is important, is because agitation um, in an orderly way, not necessarily stopping other people from speaking, but actually having your own say and asking others who may or may not be Dalit themselves to join you in this, you need a persuasive power. And that persuasive power comes from understanding, of which there are two parts, knowing the facts and reasoning about them. Critical faculty is very important, too. Now, I think if I were to give the speech in coffee houses, <laughs> which I was going to give, which I'm not now, I would have discussed how our power to reason about general subjects, not what we are studying, uh, you know, uh, in our own way, uh, whether it be high-level philosophy or, or, or financial economics or cosmology uh, or low-temperature physics, um, not just those, but things that students have reason to talk with each other. I've never taken the view that students shouldn't have a political view. I had clear political views, but I also like to listen to others who have different political views. In my day, since I was on the left of the political spectrum, one of the big issues was the marrying of a strong left-wing position with the acceptance of the democratic norms. That was a big thing. People may not remember, some people may remember, C.R. Rao uh, might remember, uh, that there was a time when in Calcutta, democracy was often described as bourgeois democracy, as if there's nothing in it. 
Now, that position no one takes, no one in the left takes now, today. But that wasn't won without any battle. There had to be a debate on that. There had to be a debate among people who were active in the student movement, as I was. And often, some of these debates take place in coffee houses, why democracy is important, and why the fact that the Soviet Union, despite its major achievements in basic education being spread across the country, which Rabindranath Tagore praised enormously when he visited Russia in his book called Russia Chitty in Bengali, Letters from Russia. And the, that was actually banned by the British government. And interestingly enough, it wasn't republished. It wasn't published until after independence. So that was a high phase of the Soviet Union in education and about health care. And yet, there was a, somehow the, the, the Soviet Union also produced uh, gulags and a lot of terrorizing realities and ultimately collapsed under its own weight. So uh, that was a nature of an argument there, namely that democracy is needed. Though the temptation to go in some other way could be strong, democracy is needed ultimately to have a solid system of equity without undermining yourself in different kind of in iniquities uh, uh, that, that may not be within your horizon. You might be think about the illiterate, about the hungry, but then there are also the political prisoners, the minorities who are discriminated against, uh, people who are taken uh, in the absence of habeas corpus, taken to jail and not allowed to move the law. Uh, all those issues have to be discussed. So these were among the issues that we were discussing greatly, even as the left-wing parties in India were moving from... Uh, uh, there are many anti-democratic left-wing parties even today, but the mainstream left-wing parties, by and large, moved out of that to a pro-democracy position, being a full partner of the... Uh, of the... Of, uh, of, of in, the, in the election that resulted. Um, uh, I, I think that was one of the issues. Also, the issue that one of the questions that often came up was the importance of judging economic progress, uh, whether we judge it by economic growth, which was a standard way of doing about it. Later, I would write on it, and I would help uh, my friend Mabu Wilhak to um, start the human development report, including uh, having a hand in making the Human Development Index. Uh, but those uh, discussions actually started not so much in Calcutta, where my main partners were people like Professor Shukumar Chakravati, probably the strongest influence on me in my student days in Calcutta. But when I was in Cambridge later, I met Mabu Wilhock on my first day arrival, and we talked a lot about what ultimately became human development. We were quite young students then, but we were discussing, uh, and I remember one conversation where Mabu Wilhack told me, judge, uh, judging things by GDP, he said, look, if India and Pakistan have the same rate of growth as the maximum that being achieved at this time anywhere in the world, then in 40 years' time, our per capita income would be that, would be similar to that of Egypt. Would that be what would be regarded as a great achievement over more than a generation. Now, I should explain that Mabu wasn't anti-Egyptian. He was just pointing out that there are better things we can do, even with low income. We could get everyone fed. We could get everyone taken care of in terms of health care. We can get 100% immunization, which India still doesn't have, only about 60%. Bangladesh has close to 100%. We don't. Uh, and there are issues that we can take up. Unfortunately, the engagement has been limited in India, and that's what the subject matter of the, my, my joint book with John Dwayne, and Uncertain Glory, and as to how those things we could have done, we didn't do. Uh, first, when India's growth rate was low, when the Indian economy became independent, 
people don't actually recognize how low the growth rate was at that time. Immediately after independence, India was growing at 3.5% three, three per year, and everyone complained that it was too low. It was too low. On the other hand, what was it following? It was 200 years of virtually no growth at all. We don't have data from the whole period, but we do know that Adam Smith in 1776 thought that India was one of the richer economies in the world. He knew mostly about Bengal, and he discussed, compared favorably, the living standard in Bengal compared with that in Europe. And he asked the question, how come they, these areas are so rich? And he attributed, and not without reason, that they have gone into trade and the rivers, the Indo-Gangetic channels, uh, had helped in that, didn't know so much about the South, so Narmada and Krishna and Kaveri didn't figure in that, but similar argument could have been made. But by the time the British were leaving, India was one of the poorest countries. We don't have growth rates for the whole period, but we do know in the first half of the 20th century, the growth rate of India GDP per capita was 0.1% a year, which is virtually zero. And that was for a 50-year period preceding independence. So the 3.5% after growth, after India's independence, was a big jump up, even though it couldn't look like that compared with other countries. And as compared with India later, they gradually the growth rate moved up, became 5%, 6%, 7 8 even 8.5%. Now it's come down. But even, even now, India's growth rate, 4.5%, is among the higher growth rates in the world. It can be raised a lot more, and we have to ask why not? What's preventing it? On the other hand, when these growth rates are, take place, what happens? Now, I have to quote Adam Smith again from 1776. He's asking, why do we want a good political economy and a good expansion of the economy? And he gives an answer. We need it for two reasons. One, it raises people's income, which allows them to do what they would like to do, have a better standard of living, having greater capability. In fact, even though I'm often given credit for inventing, uh, developing the idea of capability, many of the ideas go back to Adam Smith. And so we have that. And secondly, he said, the second object is that by high growth, when there's high growth rate, the public revenue increases fast. And that allows the state to do those things well, which only the state can do well. And he talked about the need for education for all. Didn't talk so much about health care, but it's quite clear from his reading his, that book in the context of his earlier book, um, Theory of Moral Sentiment, that he was also concerned about health care for all. Now, the resources go, could go in that direction. Unfortunately, in India, this didn't happen. When India's growth rate was 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 percent, the public revenue was going in 9, 10, 11, 12 percent. But the channeling didn't go in that direction. It went much more towards subsidizing, to some extent, already privileged consumer, consumers, not so much compared with the poorest of the poor, they were now, you know, they're, 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 they're privileged compared with the poorest of the poor, but not compared with the, uh, the, the others who are much richer. So it's something like the bottom 20% of the top 20%. Take the top 20% of the population and take the bottom 20% of that top 20%. That got itself portrayed as the poor. The, 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 the ordinary people whose interests have to be neglected. So you do fuel subsidy, kerosene uh, subsidy, power subsidy. India's electricity, India spends about 2% of GDP on power subsidy, even though one third of the population of the country don't have electric connections at all. And it's absolutely remarkable. When a year earlier, a bit over a year earlier in July, um, the power grid failed in the north, in, in, in the large part of India. Everyone said 600 million people were plunged into darkness. 
certainly two, six hundred million people did have darkness. But of these two hundred million people never had any electric connection at all. That didn't get any kind of media attention. On the other hand, the enormous failure for those who had the power and used to cheap subsidized power did. There's tremendous complaint about food security bill. And there are many ways that the food security bill could have been much better uh, produced. I don't doubt that at all. But on the subject that we can't afford it, it's worth noting that we spend much more on subsidizing power for those who have electric connection than we do on food security. It's quite a remarkable thing how the media and the dialogue has left company with the factual reality of India. And why does that happen? What's the remedy? The remedy isn't not to make the media do certain things. That is the worst remedy to think of. It's one of the glories of India that we have a free media. It has to be something of the nature of the interests of the media to cover these issues. And ultimately, the media believe that people are interested in the issue. So if you don't discuss the issue, then they will never come. Coffee house, if it fits into the story at all, I'm not giving a lecture on coffee house, I'll remind you, even though I'm referring to the word coffee house from time to time. Uh, that's, a, that's an illusion. <laughs> so it's not a lecture on coffee house. But coffee house is one of the places where this kind of discussion can take place. I remember being enormously moved. I mentioned uh, Sukhuma Chakravarti, who's a big influence on my life. Actually, I was doing physics, maths and physics, when I first met him. Came to Santa Niket when I was in school, and I was keen on doing physics. I think I might have been quite happy in physics anyway. But after some conversations with Sukhuma, I got really inspired and wanted to do economics and join him, which I did. And he was a very close friend. And I think I spent more hours with Sukhuma in the coffee house in Calcutta than, than, uh, than with anyone else. Again, I remind you, it's not a lecture on coffee house that I'm giving. <laughs> this is just an incidental relevant reference to it. Now, um, when I first met him, he was visiting Santa Niketan. We don't have coffee houses in Santa Niketan, but we can sit down somewhere on the ground. I can't do it now with my leg situation, with titanium instead of knees. Uh, it's difficult, but in those days I could. So we sat and I took Sukhumai to a, to a Kalo Dokan, which provided some coffee. And we chatted and argued. And this continued in Presidency College. And then I had similar conversation with Mabu Bulhak in Cambridge, in, in the Wim, which is a coffee place around there. Quite a lot of the Human Development Index was actually developed there talking about it when they were, both of us were, advanced undergraduates. So I think the importance of having public discussion in all kinds of forums is really important. And it's it, it, it really great. And universities can do something about that to encourage it. Now, coffee house is a place where not only you have coffee, but you can actually chat. Very important not to have any music, because that makes it very difficult to chat. And it's also very important that you're not evicted if you've just had one cup of coffee on grounds that after 20 minutes you have to go. I think a good coffee house is one which should allow you to sit there and chat. And I think I had a sense uh, the coffee house we had in Calcutta, we were very lucky. It was run by the coffee, house, uh, the coffee workers' union, but the workers' union which ran it. So they had a certain amount of sympathy on the subject that we were discussing. So we were hardly ever evicted. Every now and then, maybe a gentle suggestion that we might have some, if not coffee, at least a bhaji or something like that. Uh, so um, I think we ended, I think in quite often my attitudes were formed in these discussions. I was doing some economics too, and so was Sukhumar, so were others like Borunde, Fatu. Uh, Patsu Gupta and a uh, number of them, alas, most of them are dead now. Um, but the opportunity to discuss really serious issues, grumble about what people are not doing, not just grumble of the government, but also about political parties, 
in many ways, the left party seemed a natural one for me to be sympathetic to. They were concerned with inequality. They were concerned with the Dalit issue. Not adequately to start with, but gradually they became more interested. They were interested in scheduled tribes. And all these um, still required one to ask, is, do they have a right attitude to democracy? Do they have enough respect to human rights? Are they factually really aware? Do we get a really frank picture of what's going on in the Soviet Union and China from them? And if not, why not? All of these are subjects of discussion. And I think um, this is a really serious issue today, because if you look at, look at India today, you find that there is a reality which doesn't match people's perception. We are told, for example, that the government is overextended here and it's doing no good and it should be privatized if possible. A lot of people will tell you that. Now, certainly government has been overextended in doing things which it couldn't do well, like licensing uh, and preventing individual initiative or even business initiative. I have great sympathy for reform. At the same time, it was very underactive in education and healthcare. India spends 1.2 percent of the GNP on uh, of the GDP on governmental healthcare. China spends close to 3 percent. Uh, if you look at the share of government expenditure in total health expenditure in different countries, India is of the 200 or so countries in the, in the bottom three or four in the company of Haiti and Sierra Leone. Why? But even before that, is that perception clear? You will be told, no, the government is doing far too much. We have to privatize it. And in fact, that's what we have done because the, the basically the poor, because the, the, the public health uh, clinics are run so badly, and the Potici Trust, which I was privileged to set up with my Nobel money, we did survey some of them, are very often badly manned, very badly resourced, very badly um, uh, provided with amenities and, 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 and medicine and, 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 and medical instruments. And so people have to go to private health care. Now, one of the things we know from economics is that private sector can deliver health care very badly indeed for very poor people if there is no alternative of the state. Why? Because we know from economics, this is what the economists call asymmetric information. Three people got the Nobel on that subject many years later. Uh, uh, George Yakalov, Joe, Joe Stiglitz, and Michael Spence. This is because the buyer knows something which the seller doesn't, and seller knows something the buyer doesn't. Now, when, you, uh, when a poor peasant is ill, he or she has no idea what the ailment is. A doctor is supposed to have an idea. So there's an asymmetric information. And in that kind of a situation, in a classic paper, one of the great economists of our time, Kenneth Arrow, showed why the private sector cannot provide efficient health care under these circumstances ever. And the result is that you have to have expansion of state-provided health care. That every country in the world has done. Europe, and even if the Americans only now are talking about Obamacare, they provided basic epidemiology. There was no question of incomplete immunization, as in India. And even the hospital, public hospitals, like Harvard Medical School hospitals, they couldn't turn anyone away if they needed it. Now, it's a very inexpensive way of providing health care, and it's not a good system. On the other hand, it does accept their responsibility, which in India is not accepted. In Europe, of course, it's accepted in a big way with the National Health Service. So it is in Japan, so it is in Korea, so it is in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, which is a completely universal health insurance, and in China. They vacillated for a while after the economic reform of 79, but now they're back to nearly full coverage. So I think the perception that India is way out 
in government not doing its job. It's very important. Now, sometimes people would say that's because the government uh, cannot do anything in India. Why can't it do anything in India when it can in every other country? And if not, rather than just saying, let us therefore give it over to the private sector, which of course is a way of, in the case of the basic public health care in, 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 in among the rural population, is to give it in the hands of people who may or may not have much medicine anyway, and who certainly can count money. And the result could be an absolutely disastrous system of health care as we have. In Bangladesh, which used to be three years behind us, in healthcare, in, in life expectancy is now three years ahead. This is partly connected with the fact that they had done, to a great extent with the help of NGOs, but also government activism more. And certainly, and that's a very important point, by women's agencies. Bangladesh's economic, the medical success, on which I'm, I was privileged to write an article in the medical journal Lancet in the current number, in the December number, um, it turns out that it's really enormously the activism of the women which had made this possible. The proportion of women actively engaged in employment, industrial, educational, medical, are enormously lower in India than, than in Bangladesh. Makes a big difference. So we have to see about the delivery issue. If you look at India, Kerala began basic education for all, and then basic health care for all. When I wrote supportive things on it in 1950s and 60s, 60s mostly, I was told that Kerala had doing something which it cannot sustain. It's a poor economy. And since it's a poor economy, it's, it's, it's unaffordable. But the argument was, and that argument actually also goes back to Adam Smith, that there's nothing as important for economic expansion as healthy and educated workforce. So the hope was that Kerala would grow faster, and indeed it is. And instead of being a poor economy, it has now the highest per capita disposable income uh, among all the Indian states. To some extent, the same thing has happened in Tamil Nadu. Same thing has happened in Himachal Pradesh. And these are stories that you won't hear, actually. Why not? Why doesn't the media take an interest in it? And why doesn't the public want to hear it? So the culture of public discussion of really important social matters is quite central. The story of the Asian economic development, which India has missed out, is not at only a, a governmental miss, missing out. It is also a public missing out of the reality of it. What is the story? When, I mean, Europe and America had already done it on the basis of governmental initiatives. But when Japan in Asia, after Meiji restoration in 1860s, decided to go in that direction, the first thing was to educate everyone in the country. And as one of the leaders, um, I think uh, Hideki Obasi said that we, uh, this is 1869, I think, that we Japanese uh, and, and Americans are no different. They are much more productive than us, mainly because they are educated and we are not. So they decided immediately to go for 100% literacy, and within 45 years they achieved that. And by 1913, Japan was publishing more books than, not only publishing more books than any other country in the world, but more than twice as many books as, as the United States. And similarly, a transformation took place in healthcare. Well, we know how to go again when he went to Japan, noticed these changes and came away with an enormous uh, sense of admiration. But of course, just the, the Soviet Union lack of democracy created a big problem in Japan. Imperialism created a problem. And then there was a war, and then it went in a completely an ultra-nationalist direction. But the lesson of Japan stayed on. Korea, immediately after the war, went for massive expansion of education, healthcare, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, 
and China going through periods of turmoil. The Maoist Mao himself was quite committed to education and healthcare. On the other hand, there was there was he was neglecting the market economy, which had a very important role in the progress of an economy. Um, we shouldn't make the mistake of assuming that the market doesn't do any great thing. It does do great things, but it had to be confined to its sphere. And where the state and state alone can do it, as Adam Smith put it, there the state has to use the public revenue for that purpose. That's the dialogue which we want. Why is it that we have missed out on the Asian story of development, which is that of development through human capability expansion? Now, I shouldn't go on, and I was hoping that there might be Q&A, but we have lost a certain amount of time. So I'm not sure how much Q&A we could have, but I don't want to deliver the lecture, as I said, on the coffee house that I was going to deliver. And, but I wanted to say, in the last part of the lecture, I would have gone into this, so I, I decided to. Uh, we have this lovely word, free phone, as opposed to postpone. So I free phone that. Uh, but I think the other items won't come in. But I would say that the importance of people talking to each other on serious matters, and it's best begun in college, uh, is really extraordinarily important. Now, there is an elitism element because there's not everyone goes to college in India or any other country. But these people are really very important also. I mean, I am in favor of mass movement, always been. Uh, and yet, there is no question that college education and college educated people have a special responsibility. Their responsibility is not only to do your IT well or business management well. The responsibility is also to do social thinking well. Take note of the information. Don't suppress the information. Be curious about the information so that the newspapers are in some ways obliged to supply them rather than I had said in one of the interviews I gave, I think, in, 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 um, in, uh, in Chennai, that the newspapers seem far less interested in education and healthcare, which is a great fitting. They're much more interested in, um, in the film world and as to which of the three Khans are the greatest. <laughs> and then the, day of the two days after that, I opened the thing and I could see the headline, which is a very nice headline for me. It says, Amir Khan back then. <laughs> and he said, Amir Khan said he completely agrees that we should discuss. And now that I've got Amir Khan's support, I think I'm an easy wicket now. <laughs> <laughs> but Amir Khan is right. I support him that we ought to talk about education and healthcare. We ought to demand the media provide this kind of information. And, and, and be criticized for not doing it. Um, there is nothing wrong in being interested in Indian uh, uh, films or music. I, I'm very privileged to, uh, to release a wonderful new book on Carnatic music by um, Vidwan S.M. Krishna, uh, The Carnatic Story. It's a beautiful book. Do recommend it strongly. We have every reason, and of course we discussed also how Carnatic music could be not confined, as it had traditionally been, to the upper caste, to the Brahmins, to the men, and so on, as consumers. Uh, but to all. All that has to go on, but yet also the basics, education, healthcare, we have to constantly demand information on that, fault newspapers for not providing it, and lead the dialogue so that when we praise which state is doing how well, we don't fall for the temptation to praise achievements which are not really shown in terms of the numbers at all, but which is carried on in a story, in a kind of myth that everyone says that is, this state is doing enormously better than any other state. Now, I'm not going to mention it. The moment I mention it, in case there's a newspaper, I would read that Amartya Sen attacks Modi again. So I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> but um, the fact is that they're from the translation of, of uh, among the top five states in per capita income now, if it is Kerala, and Himachal Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, who had followed this policy and were 
very much poorer at one stage, there has to be some lesson to be learned from there, rather than saying that if Maharashtra has 8.1% growth rate and Gujarat has 8.2% growth rate, then Gujarat is a super performer in terms of growth rate. If, and if Bihar is 10.5, then we somehow neglo neglect that. So I think there's, a, there's an absolute necessity. I'm not arguing for one particular position or not. I mean, I, that I will as a voter when the election times come. But in, but in terms of advocacy, I would say that we have to discuss all those issues. And I would now end with this remark. The Dalit issue is very central, not just here, uh, in this city, in this university, but in this country generally. And there is a serious message and a serious engagement. And that's one of the things that Ambedkar said, which we quote, which is really kind of motto for my last book, namely, um, educate, organize, agitate. Education is quite important. And for that, disrupting lectures is not a very good method of doing it. And, and, and uh, Ambedkar never made a mistake on that. Uh, educate, organize, agitate. It's that combination that we want. And I think people talking with each other, coffee house may be a frivolous way of introducing the subject, but ultimately, it's our ability to talk to each other on serious subjects, which makes all the difference in the world. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, thank you so much for, for this wonderful uh, lecture, and especially for, uh, for doing it. Um, in in this in circumstances, uh, there is time. <laughs> Professor Sen has agreed for a short question-answer session. Um, earlier it was to have been a longer one, but I think uh, a shorter one would be uh, quite appropriate now. Uh, so could I take the first five questions, sir? Like. How is professional equality related to the progress of a nation? Here, I mean professional equality means, suppose we have different professions, uh, like if it takes sports, uh, scientific area of research, and uh, politics, like uh, if it's taken as a profession, and some different professions, like how is professional equality? Different members, topmost members of those professions treated, if they are treated equally, uh, how the country or the nation would progress, or if they are not treated equally, how the country will be like? What is its uh, uh, position? Uh, how far it, is it good? Uh, my question pertains to uh, the fact that throughout your lecture you referred to two words, uh, dialoguing and debating. Um, and dialoguing indicates um, two people or more than two people and uh, debating, of course, there's an assertion of one. Uh, and then uh, uh, I want to juxtapose this uh, to the title of your very famous book, Argumentative. Uh, and it, 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 the strain of all these three terms, what do you think would be most appropriate at this point in time, historical time, for well, us? What would, uh, what would be most appropriate a term, uh, you know, the argumentative debate? Because today's lecture, you never hear, use the word argumentative, and uh, you use much more dialoguing, I found that much more. Uh, but you also constantly refer to debating. So uh, at this historical point in time, in our country, what do you think, which of these words you think would be most appropriate for us to engage with? In India, there are different caste systems. Different? Castes. Castes, yeah. Castes, okay. So, what the different, different uh, articles, different, different rules and regulations for the different, different caste systems? Can we finalize into war systems and one caste? Can we make any bills or any rules and regulations into all the students who have studied in universities or colleges? Can I make e equal to only one caste after competing into their degrees? 
I think the, uh, the profession question, I think there are two ways of thinking about it. One is from an individual's education point of view. You ask yourself, what would you like to, what profession would you like to have? And that is, and there's nothing wrong with it, to a great extent, self-related thought, what Mill, John Stuart Mill would say, a self-regarding thought. On the other hand, there is also a question of what a profession would allow you to do, not in terms of uh, earning a high income, but in terms of those things to which you feel committed. And if you are having the kind of model I was discussing, your choice of the career may well be influenced by that. I think um, there's nothing wrong in giving legitimacy to both concerns. And nothing extraordinarily, there's no extraordinary failure if there are lots of people who give no concern to the second at all, only to the first. I'm not arguing for a world in which everyone feels socially committed. I think I am arguing for a world when everyone wants to know what the ground realities in the society are, what the situation of Dalits are, what the situation of the scheduled tribes are, what the caste divisions in India are. But that doesn't do prevent you from becoming a cosmologist uh, or a, um, um, uh, a um, uh, grammarian uh, or, or, or a philosopher or a logician. I think there's a distinction. So I think um, what we have to liberate is the idea that a profession defines a person. Because a profession is how you earn your income, what work you can do and you do well. But that doesn't prevent you from listening to music, from talking about politics, from voting, from agitating, from arguing with others, and I'll come to the debate question, debating uh, uh, with others. Um, so I think the professional thing should be um, put in its place rather than made into a very central question. Now, the government has to think about whether they're training enough doctors, enough engineers. Yeah, that's a, some subject called manpower planning. And I have actually done that many years ago. I had to go to Bangkok. I was there for two months giving some lectures. And there was some manpower uh, meeting going on, and they wanted me to come. I had not worked on that before. But I went there, and since the work I was doing for the UN proved to be exceedingly easy, I had a lot of time left. So I became for a while a manpower planner. And for many years, I kept on getting letters from the manpower planning society. And even one letter saying that this is a, there is going to be a discussion here um, on the subject of the inequality in India. I know it is not on manpower planning, but if you still can take an interest, it would be very nice if you could come here. So I felt very flattered that I'd become a specialized manpower planner. But even specialized manpower planners can take an interest in inequality <laughs> in, in India. I think we have to, I, this is the subject matter of my book in Identity, at, I call Identity and Violence, that we all, there's nothing remarkable in the fact that we all have many identities. This is a very important issue in every question. Profession is one way of defining us. And sometimes that could be a limitation, if it is the only one that's emphasized. Just that sometimes we could be classified as Hindus or Muslims or Sikhs. And sometimes that could be a terrible way of classifying people because it, it denies our humanity and our many common interests, including a profession in, in literature, art, uh, language, and everything else. But similarly, uh, sometimes we could be defined in terms of caste. <coughs> and yet we could try and we could transcend that. And if you think about a name that I already mentioned earlier, Ambedkar, you think of him as a Dalit leader, as a person who presents a very cogent argument for Buddhism as to why Buddhism had a message which India had not fully absorbed yet, who also is the, one of the makers of the Indian constitution. 
India went on for, for affirmative action before any other country in the world, to a great extent because of Ambedkar's ability as an Indian citizen to work in that respect. So I think we have to just um, take the professional question seriously in its context, but not demand our human identity only in that term. Now, on the subject of what is it, dialogue and debating and argument, debating and argumentation are rather close, actually. You have to accept that. Because if I'm debating you, I'm arguing with you, right? But when we uh, dialogue, it's not just arguing. It's also sometimes agreeing. That's how movements are made. When Mahatma Gandhi came back uh, from South Africa, one thing clearly, as we can see from his own autobiography he had learned, is that the power of making a whole group agree that there is a violation, just as the Dalit movement requires that. The Dalit identity should not be confined only to being a Dalit. That would be a terrible mistake. On the other hand, the Dalit identity may be very important for fighting some injustices. And so I think, and, and so dialogue is not just arguing, not just debating. It's also agreeing. And that's a very important part of what happens. If you think about um, the big agitations which make things, things changes, including right now the agitation going on about the treatment of women. Uh, I, it's, 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 it's the agreement and understanding. Uh, if I may take on the women's issue, at a point, it's extraordinary how the, that issue remained dormant for such a long time. And now, of course, in almost every rape case it gets into the newspaper in a way that it used not to. It turns out, in fact, in terms of officially reported rape in India, India is actually, if India's rape rate is about two or three a, a year, uh, that in in England and uh, Britain, uh, Germany, France, Sweden, etc. I presented in a paper in, in the New York Review called, uh, called Indian Women, the Mixed Truth, that there are about 26, 35, 40, many times. Even if we are underestimating by a factor of 10, the actual rape cases may be still lower, lower than elsewhere. The problem isn't that. It's just that the suspicion of a rape could get attention in a way in other countries which India didn't. So that's why the Verma Committee was so important, because they, they made that possible. And that, as you know, if you read the papers, how it has become a bigger, bigger issue. But there is a caste issue and a class issue there, too. Dalit women have been raped day in and day out without getting the kind of agitation that uh, Nirbhaya's treatment uh, got. Now, that agitation was an enormously important thing. So I salute it, I joined that. And yet, I would have to ask the question, why is it that Dalit women's rapes are not covered by the media in the same way? I think we come back again and again to the same question. What are we discussing? What are the truth of the matter? There's also a bifurcation in India, by the way. If you go by both rape rates, for example, Delhi has nine times the rape rate that Calcutta has. And if you divide, if you look at the sex-specific abortion of female fetuses, India splits into two halves. All the northern and western states have way below European ratio indicating uh, female uh, uh, abortion, female fetus abortion, and all the eastern and, and southern states are well within the European range. I've stated that it, it came out in the New York Review. There have been a debate on that. I haven't seen any Indian paper cover this at all. So I think it's extraordinary that how the informational limitation remains a factor. And that's where the other part of dialogue, not just argument, but knowing from each other what's happening becomes important. So thanks for asking that clarification question. And on the subject of um, caste, I think, the, I think caste has been a, such an evil in India that um, uh, 
what is remarkable is not so much that it's proving so hard to get rid of, but what is remarkable is that why that battle took so long to get engaged in. It wasn't as much a part, I mean, I know that Mahatma Gandhi did talk greatly about untouchability issue, but the whole issue of taking on the caste question as an evil, defining human beings in terms of how they are born, was an, is, is a way of um, denying people's humanity that I don't think our nationalist readers fully sad of. Now, that's becoming a bigger issue. It can become a further bigger issue, too. And that's why I'm particularly keen that the Dalit movement follows the Ambedkar line of educate, agitate, organize. And I think this is important. It's important for that to become a major voice. And if you look at the newspapers, you will not get the impression that Dalits still don't get the kind of treatment of, of civil tribes. Don't. If I, we studied, for example, the editorial staff, Ro and I did, Ro did mostly. I have a lovely partner relation with Ro, whereby he does 90% of the work and I get 90% of the credit uh, and blame too. <laughs> but he did most of it. We couldn't find among the editorial group a single Dalit, not to mention single federal caste, in any of the major papers. Very rare. I think he was looking only at El Habad, admittedly. But I think it, there's a deep asymmetry. But an editor doesn't have to be Dalit to take an interest in this issue. People have taken an interest in this issue beyond their own, own orbit of, of, of birth. But we have to put that issue for dialogue, learning from each other, and debate, debating each other and arguing as to why do you say that? Why do you say that the, the Dalit issue isn't so big? Uh, it is big, and what's your argument again? And if we are worried that some leader may, be, uh, may terrorize or, 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 or drive fear in the mind of minorities like Muslims, we have to, why, why is it that the people who want to save business progress don't see that there is a problem here? There's a genuine issue of engagement involving all the arms of of the dialogic process, namely um, uh, 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 talking with each other, uh, discussing things, arguing with each other, uh, debating with each other, and ultimately agitating about it in an informed way. So thanks for these lovely questions. Sir, you have been accomplished in, uh, in the early part of your life in uh, India, then UK, then USA. Uh, my question is, starting from the President from Mukherjee's worry that nobody in India after uh, Raman has been able to get a Nobel Prize by working within India. So, would you like to suggest what should the higher education system do to uh, come up? For example, when there is a list of 100 institutions, India does not uh, fare there. So, there is something wrong somewhere. What is your opinion about what should the higher education system do? Um, given the importance given to Ambedkar and his ideas on equality as a right and as a force between, as a force and uh, establishment of equality in difference and thereby establishing justice. How do you uh, analyze the institutional implementation of justice as a distributive principle? Sir, uh, I am a sociology student. I would like to ask one question, sir. India, neoliberal India is facing two kinds, two models of development. One is neoliberal model of development, and another is the Jantan Sarkar model of development for the tribal centers. For which one you would like to choose in this uh, two, uh, in the two model of uh, development? And the other thing, you have given lecture on coffee houses. JNU has witnessed the breaking of Nescafe coffee house. It means it is a re if, if you put it in a Habermas uh, terminology, it is a re of coffee houses. Does the uh, India middle class has this dialogue, the space for dialogue and uh, uh, kindly reflect on this? Sir. Uh, I am very much fond of the idea of informed public discussion uh, in the modes of agitation. And also in the, uh, the, the, the principles which you have uh, told on Dr. B. R. Sir, at the same time, 
what, how can we uh, uh, put the point when institutions fail to engage in the informed public discussion? Sir, I am referring to this in the context of the uh, movements which are going outside and also the policies which are being framed. Sir, in the context of inclusive growth, a debate on inclusive growth which has been generated in the level 5, five year plan, uh, there has been a mention about land reform. Uh, on one hand, there have been a movements which have been going about uh, uh, land reform, but as an institution, the institution doesn't recognize the movements. It doesn't communicate with the movements which are going on at the ground level. So how can we understand the institutional failure and also uh, 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 the leadership, uh, which, which, which kind of deliberately, uh, 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 what do you call, like, suppresses the uh, genuine movements. Uh, that the question of informed uh, public discussion doesn't hold. So, uh, yeah. Let me um, move from uh, the reverse order of the question. Um, so I'm glad we agree that informed public discussion is important. If you feel that informed public discussion is not taking place, what you have to do is to demand that. Now, uh, I'm not going to comment on the style of the demand, which was an issue that came up earlier uh, in the present context. But you have to demand it, and that is what, what really democratic dialogue is about. And you know, one of the advantages of living in a, in a democratic society is that basically we are able to express our views with the force that is needed. I think it's very odd when, I, when in our book when we found that China was in many areas doing enormously better than India, despite not having democracy. It wasn't so much to say that it's democracy's fault, but it's our fault that we have not been able to use democracy for the purpose for which it could be used. Everything that has been made into a public concern, a big public concern, shared public concern, uh, and even if it is an issue about Dalit, it could be a general public concern, it becomes a success. Let me uh, illustrate. I, a long time ago I said, um, I, 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 in an article, it was actually a popular article in New York Review, said that famines do not take place in, in a democratic functioning democracy. How does that happen? Now, it's because talents are easy to prevent and the government is forced to act if people want it. How many people are threatened by famine? I spent about 15 years studying famines across the world. I think there's hardly any famine about what I don't know something about many of them I've written. I don't know any famine which killed more than 10% of the population. Mostly, they kill about two or three, maybe five percent, and hardly any famine which affects more than 15 percent of the population. That's a minority. How come that voice is so strong in democracy? It's because the deprivation of the famine victims, and the same thing could apply to Dalits or the scheduled tribes, could become a shared concern if we succeed in making the point to informed argument. Lot of the things that are denied, whether it's saying that Dalits don't get a such a bad treatment or scheduled caste, they're doing fine, I talk with them, they're very nice and very happy. And similarly, uh, about uh, other issues in this case, could have been um, um, people uh, regular undernourishment, it doesn't get any kind of attention. But famine, it got very politicized partly connected with the nationalist movement because the British Empire was born in a famine in 1770 and died in a famine in 1943. So it became something where the government had to do something and as a result, famine disappeared. We were told not long ago that India was going to be the center of, 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 of AIDS epidemic in the world, dwarfing all other countries. It became a major issue there are a lot of books. I even wrote an introduction to a book by, uh, by, uh, by, by uh, novelists, really, fiction writers. And it became a big issue. And now uh, no one really counts India as among the highest uh, AIDS population, AIDS mortality countries. 
in fact, even the official estimate of the UN, which is lower, uh, uh, much uh, lower than uh, that was anticipated and lower than most countries. Um, it turns out that in a recent study by Tovar Jha, based on, um, on, on actual mortality uh, background check, that we underestimate the death from malaria, but we overestimate the death from AIDS. It, it's about a quarter of the actual uh, number that the UN does, which is already low. What happened? It was politicized. It became clear after the debacle connected with the tsunami that the government did not act sufficiently quickly and well. So when we had recently a hurricane, which was five times the size of Katrina, the government was able to move a million people off the coast so that the mortality rate, instead of being in thousands, as in many of these hurricanes across the world, ended up between 10 or 15. So this is an important point to recognize. Things happen if we demand it. But we have to demand it in an informed way. The, the reason why Ambedkar wins every time is that educate, agitate, organize is the combination that we want. So that's the way I would deal with your question. Now, on the subject of um, newer levels, you know, I, these, these terminologies actually hide as much uh, uh, the process of thinking as they do, because what you do is that you use one word and then try to capture a complex reality in terms of that one word. There are big differences between people who want a market economy and people who want a market economy only. In, sometimes I've seen neoliberal used to apply to Adam Smith, who was arguing, as I said, that the government has to do its job and it's really very important. So I think the right way of thinking about it is not neoliberal, socialist, uh, or whatever you have, but to say, what are the institutional combinations you're looking at? And you have to see whether the institutional combination is right. Take China. It's a very interesting case. During the Maoist period, they were not, not only not neoliberal, they are ferociously non-neoliberal. So they didn't give any room for the market economy. However, they educated people in school. Not very good school, but pretty much everybody. And they had health care for all. Not very good health care, but for all. Never a situation like in India. But since the market was so badly neglected, the economy of languishing. China's per capita income was lower than that of India's then. Then came 1979, and then there was a wholesale change. A one label anti-market was replaced by pro-market. Marketization in agriculture did an enormous amount of good. The Chinese agriculture grew faster every year for a decade or more than any country in the history of the world. And the bulk of the poverty removal happened then. The industry did pretty well on the market, though there are room here to debate on that subject a little bit. Where it did not work well at all, was when the Chinese privatized healthcare. Suddenly, instead of having universal insurance, you had to buy your health insurance. Instead of 100% coverage, China ended with 12% coverage. And the Chinese life expectancy, which was growing rapidly, was 14 years ahead of India's in 79 at the time of reform, started languishing. China had moved rapidly to 68. And in the following 25 years, when China was having the fastest rate of growth in the history of the world, it proceeded only three years from 68 to 71. India even caught up. The gap, instead of being 14 years, became seven years. Then the Chinese suddenly recognized that what had gone wrong is the formula that either you're pro-market or anti-market. Market was brilliantly in some areas, but not so brilliantly at all in other areas. As Adam Smith said, the state has to do those things which only the state can do. 
And then in a rapid move beginning in 2004, they changed. But now, by now, they have 96% covered. And the Chinese life expectancy is again, again galloping forward compared with, with India. Not higher than Kerala still. That's because Kerala already had the health care system of the kind that the Chinese uh, are practicing. And indeed, the Kerala's growth rate itself, as I discussed earlier, has been quite remarkable. Not quite the Chinese, but very much higher than any other state, including Gujarat and Maharashtra. So I think we have to try to wean ourselves away from binding up our thought in this terminology like neoliberal, you know, we want to, whatever it is, it has to be some form of capitalism, or what we want is socialism. I, you know, these words have a clear meaning, and in particular debate, yes, they do have a meaning, but, and they signify something, and I will tell you a story on that in a minute, uh, at, at the end of it, but I don't want to get into the story yet. But that's what I would say about that, that try to think about, break down your thoughts as to what policy do you actually want. You said something about coffee house and JNU. I don't know the story. And remember, I didn't give my coffee house lecture anyway. Uh, no. So there was the institute uh, question that somebody asked. I, I think institutional combination is very important. But human um, movement, including agitation, including discussion, including debates, are important because the institution can never take place of that. India has a democratic system. There's no reason why the grievances of the most deprived people, whether they be Dalit or be, uh, of, of the very poor or women, and if you happen to be a Dalit, be poor, and a woman, your chances are very limited indeed. Why is it that these interests do not receive the attention as in a democracy it should? Well, I think what's failing is not the institution. It's our ability to make use of the institution for the purpose for which we, we, they, were, uh, they were devised. And that's the, one of the points that Ambedkar made. We have got an institutional setup, but none of that will actually, that's the context he's making the remark, would work and achieve without the absence of educate, agitate, and organize. So I think institution, yes, we'll look for it. I have a book on that called the idea of justice, where I discuss that issue, what institutional combination, how it relates to human agitation and human discussion. So I, I will refer to that. Now, then there was a question about Nobel. Now, I'd, say, I'd never comment on Nobel, actually. Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, it wasn't that I was unhappy that I got it. Uh, I think my life would have gone fine even if I didn't get it. Uh, I, I was terrified when the news came because I had flown the night before in Concord. In those days, Concord was still flying to New York because there was a memorial meeting for Mabubul Haq. My friend had just died. And I, I was speaking in the memorial meeting. So I arrived, went to bed about 12, and then 5 o'clock, they're ringing up because it's 11 o'clock in Stockholm. And of course, you think that something has happened to the children. So at the middle of the night, and so when I picked up, and they said, this is the oil, and I saw that, you know, could be a motor accident or what. And so when they said, this is the Royal Swedish Academy speaking, my first thought wasn't even no Nobel. It was that it couldn't be any children, because somehow it couldn't come by the Royal Swedish Academy. And then it occurred to me, it must be it, isn't it? And then it was. But then, of course, it, it's a bit terrifying because they don't tell you. The first of all, they read the preamble, bearing in mind the will of Alfred Nobel. And, and they've gone on. And then when it dawned on me, I was very tempting to say, come to the subject. <laughs> but then, and then ultimately, they did come to the subject. And, and so I, I had to. Um, uh, 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 um, talk about my work, uh, and I, I also perhaps add a story there too. That when I was, when I went, uh, I, I think I went to CNN or CNBC, which had hooked up with the Indian television. Naturally, that was what I wanted to talk to. 
So I went there. There was a Swedish gentleman with a camera on his back. And he said, um, uh, uh, um, um, I have to interview for five minutes. I said, well, I'm supposed to be here. No, no, they're setting up the stage for you. I would ask you only five minutes. And as we were walking, he said, um, I'm very surprised, Professor Sen, that you got the Nobel. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm, I'm, I don't think that's a terribly nice thing to say. <laughs> First thing in the morning. <laughs> and he said, no, no, I have all your books. But I thought these bastards will never give you the prize. So that pleased me that at least some people thought I deserved it even before. <laughs> and indeed, uh, there were more people losing money on betting on me uh, for three years preceding that. So in some way, they were blaming me, saying, why aren't you getting the prize? Because I've lost you know, there's this lottery. You put in a dollar. And then if you get the winner, then it's divided between the winner. So people have been losing money. Kosi Vasu, my student, said, that for five years he lost money on me. And then in the year I got it, he did not invest in me. <laughs> I told him that that's what good economics is like. <laughs> but I ought to say, and this is a serious point, that the, um, in concerning front of, uh, front of uh, the presidents who are concerned, the papers for which, I mean, they added at the end other things, but the first two pages, uh, all about my work that was done in the Delhi School of Economics. That was entirely about social choice theory. The first paper cited, even those who said that first time a non-mathematical work is being honored. Well, the first paper was called, that the cited is called Necessary and Sufficient Condition for Binary Consistency of Majority Decision. Not exactly a non-mathematical <laughs> title. So, uh, but they were all done in Delhi School of Economics. That was jointly done with Prashanta Patnaik. I had terrific students in Delhi School of Economics. And I think my work in social choice theory wouldn't have gone at all like that. And in fact, between us, between my student, me, and others working with us, we transformed the subject. But that began in the Delhi School of Economics. So that I would like to emphasize. I don't think I have time to tell the story about identity. So I think I'm going to leave it here. But thank you very much.